Okay, uh, welcome to the lecture. We'll get started here in just a second. We're going to start lecturing on uh, chapter one. Seems like a good place. Reminder, uh, when you are here, please uh, type here in the chat box. So again, uh, we'll get started here with uh, chapter one and uh, these lecture notes can be found up there on our Canvas site. Uh, if you wanna use them to sort of follow along with, uh, you can print them out and use them and everything like that. And we'll give everybody just uh, another minute or so here before we begin. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so <clears throat> we'll get started here. Uh, reminder again, uh, these notes, like I just said, is on our Canvas site. And we're gonna start here with chapter one. So in chapter one, uh, we're gonna talk about matter, obviously, as it says, uh, we're gonna get into measurements, uh, how to take proper measurements. We're gonna talk about things like significant figures, uh, conversions, dimensional analysis, and then I believe we'll finish up there talking about uh, density at the end of this chapter. So a lot of sort of information here in this chapter that we'll go over and we'll get started here. Uh, a reminder as well, if you do have any questions, feel free to uh, chat them over if you like. Uh, if you want, uh, you could also open your microphone there and, and ask a question if you feel comfortable doing that. If not, again, um, you can uh, just chat the question. I'll get to the answer, even if it happens to be uh, we moved on or something like that. All right. Okay, let's see here. So let us get started here. So again, uh, <clears throat> chapter one, uh, talking about matter and measurements. So first off, let's just talk a little bit about obviously chemistry and sort of uh, what's involved with chemistry. Chemistry obviously is the field of study that really does involve matter. And a lot of what we look at in terms of matter is sort of the changing of that matter. A lot of times from one state to the next. Uh, matter basically is anything that has mass and occupies space and that's pretty much everything, you know, uh, that there is. Um, <clears throat> and when we talk about matter, there really is sort of two states of matter that we talk about. And matter that we talk about is uh, solid, liquid, and gas. And in the solid state, everybody is there pretty close to one another and tight to each other, not a lot of room for movement. So in the solid state, uh, you know, things are very rigid. They don't really move around. In the liquid state, we have everybody still pretty close to each other, but again, a little bit more room for movement. And that's why when we think about liquids, it's more fluid uh, that's going on. And then obviously when we get to gas, everybody has pretty much completely broken away from each other. They're flying around free from one another and in the gas state as they're moving around and colliding with the container, for example, uh, that's what we associate pressure with. And obviously we have a whole chapter uh, devoted to gases and pressure and we'll talk more about that obviously later in the chapter. So a lot of what we deal with in chemistry and it obviously affects all aspects of life. Uh, you know, you think from food uh, to 
for example, cosmetics, shampoos, you know, those type of uh, things all involve some sort of chemistry uh, involved with it. So it really does sort of interact in a lot of different areas of our life. And again, solid liquid gas are very common states and also the transitions that we do. So for example, if we go from solid to liquid, that's the process known as melting, right? So if you think about, if you take an ice cube out and it starts to melt, obviously, as it picks up some energy, if we go backwards from liquid back to solid, that's the process of freezing. So if you take that liquid water, right, put it back in the freezer, the ice will come back as it freezes. As we go from, say, solid to gas, that's the process of evaporation or vaporization. As we go from gas back to liquid, that's the process of condensation. And there's also a process where we go directly from solid to gas, we skip the liquid completely, and that's the process known as sublimation. We also can go from gas again back to solids, skipping the liquid phase along the way, and that's what's known as deposition. So for example, sublimation, when we go from solid to gas directly, a very common example of that is uh, dry ice. Uh, dry ice again is solid, and it goes from solid directly to gas, no liquid cleanup in between or anything like that. Dry ice, as you may know or may not know, is, is not ice uh, and not water, basically. It is carbon dioxide um, that does that. So these are really the changes of state and the sort of transitions that occur as matter goes from one state to the next. And this also involves some things that we'll talk about as well. It also involves energy involved in these things. As we go from solid to liquid to gas, you need to put energy in to do that. So if you think about the example of the ice cube, the ice cube, when it comes out, say, of the freezer, it picks up all the heat and energy from the surroundings. As it gains that energy, it starts to melt, and it goes into the liquid phase. If you, say, take liquid water and you want to make some pasta, right, you put it on the stove, you heat it up with some fire, it gains all that energy from the fire and that water then goes from water to steam, which is also water, again, changing into the gas phase. So all those processes as we go from solid to liquid to gas, those are what are referred to as endothermic processes. Endothermic means that you absorb energy. And the opposite would be true as we go pretty much in the opposite direction, starting at gas, going to liquid, and then going to the solid state. The opposite is really true. So if you think about the gas state, they're flying around really fast. So they need to lose energy. So as they give off energy, the molecules or whatever they may be that are flying around, they're then going to kind of slow down. So as when they come to each other, they're no longer going to have enough energy really to sort of escape each other. They're going to kind of stick and go into the liquid phase. And if you continue to take energy out, they will then no longer have enough energy really to pass each other in the liquid phase and kind of go into the solid state. And that process where we sort of release energy is in terms of energy known as exothermic. So exothermic are processes that release energy. So going from solid to liquid to gas, again, an endothermic process in terms of energy, heat has to be absorbed, going the opposite way we need to release it. Also very important as well is this idea here of, for example, melting and freezing. That actually does occur at the same temperature. So it actually does occur at the same temperature. So for example, for water, that's zero degrees Celsius. At exactly zero degrees Celsius, we have basically both phases in equilibrium with each other, which means at exactly zero degrees Celsius, we have some ice, for example, for water and some liquid water kind of happening like ice crystals. It's not really to get a little bit below zero degrees that you really do form solid ice, not until you're a little bit above zero degrees that you get into that liquid water, but exactly right at zero, which is what is sometimes referred to as the normal freezing point, the normal boiling, uh, not boiling point, normal freezing point or melting point uh, for water is zero degrees Celsius. 
what happens is it all depends on pretty much what is going on in terms of energy. So when you're at zero degrees Celsius, if you continue to put energy in to the water, it will continue down the path here and go from solid to liquid to gas. Or if you're at zero degrees Celsius and you continue to remove energy, it will go basically down towards the solid side and continue to make solid. Same thing over here, evaporation and condensation also happens at the same temperature. So these two guys here, evaporation and condensation, that happens at the normal boiling point of a substance. And for water, that's 100 degrees Celsius. And same deal for water at 100 degrees Celsius. You basically have both phases together. So you have liquid water and you also have uh, gas occurring at the same time at exactly 100 degrees. Same deal, not until really you get just above 100 degrees Celsius that you will get steam or gas. Not until you get a little bit below 100 degrees Celsius that you'll have liquid water. So again, uh, where these processes occur in terms of melting and freezing, which are basically opposites of each other, occurs at the exact same temperature. Same thing with evaporation and vaporization and condensation occurs at the exact same temperature. Again, just really what is happening in terms of energy sort of determines what we're going to see in terms of the state of that particular substance. So uh, these are the three states of matter. So let's talk a little bit about, um, a little bit about uh, each of them. So solid is typically very rigid. It has a diff definite shape and a definite size. So things that are solid, for example, probably the tabletop there that you got going on uh, in your house or anything like that that's really solid, not very easy to change the shape of it or, or you know, without maybe breaking it with a chainsaw or something like that. So things like bones, silver, uh, dollars, these are all examples of solid. And in most cases, most substances, kind of like what this picture shows here, most substances in the solid state are packed in pretty tight to one another. So they're in there pretty tight and close to one another. And there's not a lot of room for movement. They don't have enough room to sort of go around each other. And again, that's why we get this sort of rigid uh, shape that we associate uh, with solid. Liquids on the other hand have an indefinite shape and they have a definite volume. So what that means is they don't really have a shape liquid, but they typically will take the shape of whatever container they happen to be in. So what that means is, for example, if you take some water and you have it in a water bottle, the liquid will take the shape of the water bottle. If you poured out the water into like a trash can, for example, it would take the shape of the trash can. If you take that water out of the trash can, put it into one of those silly straws to just go around and around and around, it would take the shape of the silly straw. What it means about having a definite volume is that if you, for example, started with say five milliliters of water, which is a volume, and you had five milliliters of water and you took it into the trash can, moved it from the trash can into a beaker, into the beaker, into a bottle, whatever it may be. As long as you are not a klutz or anything like that, as long as you're not a klutz or anything like that, it would uh, definitely still be five milliliters if you didn't spill anything. Again, should just take the shape of that. That's a, that's a good question, Plato. I, I would assume that it would be more of, of the solid variety. It would be my guess, it would probably be the best classification, I would think, of Plato in, in that sense. In this sort of natural state. Yeah. You know, there, it's a, sort of a combination, as it's a little bit of uh, obviously not rock hard. Plato that's been out a while obviously gets really rock hard, right? You can't really change it and stuff like that, probably because it lost a lot of the water content. So it does have sort of a mixture of, you know, it's not really a pure substance. So it's probably a mixture of a couple of things together. And when it definitely loses sort of that water content, it definitely becomes rock hard, right? If you ever open up your thing of Play-Doh, especially if you have kids, right? And you go, oh shoot, now it's like rock hard, right? And stuff like that. Uh, gas, on the other hand, has an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume. So gases, because they're constantly moving around, 
they pretty much will fill the container uniformly. So as they're flying around, they're hitting the containers. Uh, that, again, that's what causes the pressure that we associate with it. And they fill it uniformly because they are in constant motion, which means whatever is sort of the volume of the container they're in, they pretty much will fill it sort of uniformly as it goes through it. And again, as you can see sort of in these pictures in our liquid state, still pretty tight together, uh, everybody, but a little bit more room of movement than here in the solid state. And obviously, as you can see down here in the gas state, pretty much, you know, everybody's completely away from each other. And that's usually the, the case for most things, as we'll talk about, I think in a later chapter as well, uh, water is one exception uh, to the normal states of matter. Water actually in its solid state uh, is actually less dense than its liquid state. And that's because when water comes together in the solid state, it creates a lot of open space between the different water molecules and it affects things like density, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in this chapter. So let's talk about some properties of matter. Um, properties are really characteristics that uh, really can be used to identify a particular substance. Um, you know, for example, things like physical properties, things that you could observe without changing basically the identity of it. Uh, things like color, odor, physical state is a very common uh, physical property, things like solid, liquid, gas things like melting points and boiling point. So for example, you know, if you had water versus say ammonia or Windex, for example, if you smelled the Windex or some type of ammonia type product, it definitely has a very distinct smell, very different than uh, say water smell, hopefully. And you'd be able to obviously identify one versus the other. So physical properties are these properties that really can be observed without really changing any type of identity of a particular substance. And that's different than a chemical property. In a chemical property, we deal with characteristics that basically describe how substances can either go through some type of change to form a new substance or resist a change. So usually chemical properties are really tied to uh, chemical reactions. And when something goes through a chemical reaction, it is uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it is uh, changing from a completely new substance. So whatever it started at, it will sort of change into something completely new. And when we talk about chemical properties, it's that ability to go through a chemical reaction or the ability to resist a chemical reaction. That's really important. So again, a lot of times that involves a, a chemical reaction happening, things like rust, patina. Uh, again, examples are really chemical changes that occur. So in general, when we talk about sort of physical changes, physical properties, chemical changes, chemical properties, the main difference as we'll see here on the next slide really is, is that idea. When we talk about a physical change, a physical change is basically a process where the substance will basically change in appearance. But fundamentally what you start with and what you end up with are exactly the same thing. So they are fundamentally exactly the same. Nothing has changed. You haven't formed any new, um, excuse me, you haven't formed any new compounds or anything like that. And you can usually get back what you started with by doing some type of physical change. So some type of physical change is things like freezing, melting, boiling, those type of things. So for example, here, the sadness here of the ice cream, top guy is starting to melt on the bottom cone there, right? And we've all had this happen to us, unfortunately, right? So if ice cream melts, you can still get ice cream back and it is still ice cream, just happens to be melted at that point. But if you take that melted ice cream, put it back in the freezer, you will get kind of your ice cream back in this kind of original form. So you could regenerate. So melted ice cream, solid ice cream, it's all still fundamentally still ice cream. And again, that would be an example of a physical change. And that's very different than in a chemical change. In a chemical change, that is a process where whatever you start with fundamentally changes to something different. So whatever you start with changes into a new substance and into something that is very different. And the key to that is once it changes, 
there's really no way to get back the original substance by any type of physical means. So for example, if we take uh, <clears throat> hydrogen gas and oxygen gas and we make water, that is a chemical change. What we started with at the beginning is hydrogen gas, which is the H2 by itself, oxygen gas, which is the O2 by itself. And what it forms is water, H2O, that has come together, and probably should do the right thing and balance there. And <clears throat> now if we take water, for example, we could do a lot of things to water. We could heat it, uh, we, you know, we could boil it, we could freeze it, and you could do all of those things and you will never get back the hydrogen gas and oxygen gas that it came from. And the only way that you would actually be able to get these back is to do another chemical change. You can take water and run an electrical current over it and it will break back into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And that is an example of another chemical change that occurs. And that is different than if we do take something like ice, for example, and if we heat it up and we get liquid water, and we continue to heat it up and we get steam. So all of these things, if you take an ice cube out and it melts into liquid water, ice is really fundamentally H2O. Liquid water is also H2O. And when we get steam, when we say put a, a pot of boiling water or water onto the stove and start to boil it, that steam that comes out is still water fundamentally. There are all the same fundamental properties all the way across. Nothing has fundamentally changed into anything else. And we could get all these guys back by doing some type of physical change. We can trap the steam and cool it down. It will go through condensation and form liquid water. You could take the liquid water, throw it into the freezer. It will freeze back into ice. Again, when we do all those things with the water here, you're going to get all these guys, which are physical changes. There's no way to get the hydrogen gas or oxygen gas back. Again, that requires some type of chemical change where you're actually changing something from into a new substance. Rust, for example, rust starts with iron, iron metal, and you need a little bit of oxygen and you'll eventually make iron three oxide. And this is basically rust here. And <clears throat> rust is a combination of iron and oxygen that have now come together and combined. And you could do a lot of things to rust. You could put it in the freezer. You could, I guess, heat it up technically and all that good stuff. You won't get the iron metal back. You won't get the oxygen back by any type of physical means. So we have formed something fundamentally different from what we started with. Uh, copper and also uh, when copper goes through oxidation, it forms that patina color, right? And again, um, it has formed something that is a new uh, substance from where it came from. So that's the major difference between those two things, physical change, what you start with and what you end up with, exactly the same thing fundamentally, may just appear different. In a chemical change, what you start with and what you end up with are two fundamental different things and you cannot get back the original substance by any type of physical means. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them as we go through here. So mixtures is the next thing we're gonna talk about. So let's talk about a pure substance first off. A pure substance is basically any single kind of matter that's by itself, uh, all together, nothing really changing. So uh, we cannot, separate it into anything else. So if you had just H2O by itself, just water, that would be a pure substance. If you had sugar by itself, like I said there, if you had say a piece of uh, iron metal by itself, it would also be a pure substance. Now a mixture is when we combine two or more pure substances together. And when they do mix together, they actually do retain their identity although it may not appear that they have retained their identity, they will mix together and still retain their identity. So for example, if we take two pure substances like salt 
and water. Water by itself is a pure substance. Salt, or sodium chloride, if you will, by itself is a pure substance. But if we put these two together and make salt water, we have now made a mixture, a mixture of both of those things. Now, if you take something like salt water and you take some salt into water, you may be aware of that the salt will dissolve and it may just look all the same throughout. Now, there's really two types of mixtures. One is a heterogeneous mixture. And in a heterogeneous mixture, what that means is when you mix these different substances together, even after sufficient mixing, you will basically still see things in separate phases, or they're sometimes called separate layers. So for example, chocolate chip cookies. After you mix everything together, you bake it, all that good stuff, you can still clearly see the chocolate chips, if you made a correct chocolate chip cookie, by the way, you can still see the chocolate chips in that cookie, you know, with your sort of naked eye there, you can see different layers that are there as well. Um, if you take some metal and you put it in sand, you could take some solid pieces of metal, you can mix it all day with the sand, they're never gonna mix together. You could still see the probably pieces of metal that are in there. And that is different than a homogeneous mixture. In a homogeneous mixture with sufficient mixing, everything will look the same throughout. It will almost look like there's just one phase. And that would be this example up here that we just talked about this would be considered a homogeneous mixture. If you think about salt water, like I said before, the salt will dissolve in the water part. And when you look at it, it just looks like water. So for example, if you went to the beach or something, got some ocean water, and you just got the water, nothing else floating around in the ocean. Um, you know, it just looks like water. But if you maybe taste the salt uh, water before from the ocean, you know, it does taste a little salty and stuff like that. And there's definitely salt and probably other things mixed in there. Um, but it does look just like water and you can't really tell the difference between say salt water and regular water. Even if you put sugar, for example, in water, same thing, uh, sugar water and regular water will look the same. Uh, and those are examples of homogeneous mixtures. Uh, air as well, when we look at air, in most cases we can't really see the air, but air is a mixture of a lot of different things. The major component of air, by the way, is nitrogen. Uh, followed by oxygen, argon, and some other things, depending on where you're breathing your air. But in most cases, when you look at air, it just looks like air. You don't see different layers happening in most cases uh, when you look at it. Now, mixtures, regardless of, uh, regardless of sort of the classification, homogeneous or heterogeneous, uh, each mixture you can definitely you can definitely um, separate out the original components. Yeah, so I, I would say a mixture of oil and water would, would most likely be considered uh, more of a heterogeneous mixture. They're really not gonna mix together, so they're gonna kind of layer out, and you definitely will, will see that. They'll mix for a little bit, but you know, even like, for example, when you do, uh, you know, like oil and vinegar, like for bread at like restaurants, right? You use, have some oil, you can put some vinegar in it and like the vinegar kind of just sticks in like little spots in the oil before you mix it. You know, it, you could definitely see some different layers. So if you had to choose between those two, it'd definitely be more obviously the heterogeneous uh, type of mixture. So when we, um, when we have a mixture, regardless if it's heterogeneous or homogeneous, a very important part is that they do retain their identity. Uh, which means that we can get back the original substance through some types of physical means. So let me see where I could maybe do this. I got somewhere to write on. I'm just gonna go back. I'm gonna go back right here to the front page, why not? So for example, let's say we had a mixture of say sand and salt water, right? So let's say we had this mixture This mixture itself of the sand and the salt water is a heterogeneous mixture, right? If you put sand in water, you're definitely gonna see 
the sand definitely you can mix it all day sand is not going to dissolve or anything like that so one way if we wanted to separate out these two things is we could do a process known as filtration and filtration is kind of like when you take a funnel you could put a uh, piece of filter paper in there and maybe something to collect there. And if we take this mixture here of the sand and salt water and we pour it into our funnel here, what's going to be trapped up on the filter paper should be the sand, right? And dripping through here should be our salt water, right? And by doing this very simple process of filtration, we were able to separate out this heterogeneous mixture, right? And if we wanted to, we could take the sand that would end up on the filter paper in the funnel and we could let it dry out and it would completely dry out and we would have our sand back in its original form. We will also have our salt water exactly the way it was in its original form as well. Now we could actually take the salt water, which now if that's the only thing that we have left, Salt water is a homogeneous mixture. And we could actually separate out this salt water and get back our original components as well. If we take, say, the salt water and put it into a container. Nice artwork here. Sort of a closed system, basically two containers that has a tube connecting them. And if we keep this tube really cold, like the tube that connects them, and we put our salt water into here. And I decide I'm going to heat my salt water. Nice Bunsen burner there. Hard to believe I failed art, but we'll go with it. So as I start to heat the salt water here, hopefully you know, right, when we start to heat water, we should then start to make steam. Yeah, we're gonna start to make some steam. And now because this entire thing is enclosed, the steam has nowhere to go. So the steam is gonna go this way. And when we have steam, which is gas, and we cool down gas as we talked about earlier today, the steam or the gas will go through condensation. And what's going to happen is as it comes down this way, we are now going to get water that's gonna come over on this side. And if we continuously heat the salt water, we will get to a point where we eventually evaporate off all of the water that was there. And eventually what's going to happen is we will have nothing left on the left-hand side except for the salt. Hopefully it's not red, but you know, most likely it'd be white with the sodium chloride. But we'll have this salt that's left over. And now through this process, which is known as distillation, it's a process where you can very simply heat up a, a, a mixture like salt water, which is homogeneous. And again, a reminder, when you look at the salt water, it looks just like one thing. You can't see the salt. It appears the salt is completely gone. It just disappeared, but it really didn't disappear. All that salt to dissolve really got just mixed up in the water. And when it gets mixed up in the water, you really can't see it anymore. And it dissolves or disappears, quote unquote. But now once we do this process and we heat off that water, we will then be able to see the salt reform and come back. And now in this process, same deal. At the end of it over here, we have just the salt by itself, which if we wanted to, we could let it completely dry out. And we have now got back the salt from our original mixture. And over here as well, if we collect the water, we have our water. So in this process here where we started with basically three different pure substances that were all mixed together, we have our sand and our salt water all mixed together. By first doing the filtration, we were able to separate out the sand from the salt water. And filtration is a really good way to separate out solid from liquid. So solid from liquids, filtration is a, a really good way to separate those things out. And once we got the solid out of the way, we could then take our homogeneous mixture, which again, just looked like water, and doing this simple process where you heat it up, we could get the water and the salt away from each other. And again, if we wanted to collect everything, 
we now have, you know, one thing here that was in the mixture, two things, and all three things back in their original form, just like they were before they were mixed together. And this is all examples of physical changes because again, in the mixture of sand and salt water, they're all still sand and salt water in that case. There's still sand, salt, and water there. Nothing has changed into any new substance. And we can see that as we go through each of these steps, which are all, again, physical type changes that we could get back our original substances in their original forms. Any questions on that there? Okay, then let us continue on then and talk about a couple other sort of parts of uh, matter. Elements, elements are really sort of uh, the, um, <clears throat> as far back as you could go in terms of a substance that you could break it back down into it. Elements, uh, normally I point to the periodic table, uh, can be found on the periodic table. Look in your book, I suppose. Um, but, uh, Elements really can be thought of as um, sort of like the alphabet, right? There's only so many letters in the alphabet, but different combinations of those letters give us different words that have different meanings and so forth. Kind of the same idea here. Elements are sort of as far back as you could go. They're kind of the basic units of substances and different combinations of elements, different ways they come together, different numbers of even the same elements will give us different compounds. So a compound is a pure substance that is formed by chemically joining two or more elements. So aluminum metal by itself is a element. Sodium chloride is the combination of sodium metal and chlorine gas, which are two elements that come together is a compound. Now elements can also be what are known as molecules. So for example, H2, O2, N2, F2, Cl2, I2, and Br2. These are all elements. That's hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, nitrogen gas, fluorine, chlorine, iodine, and bromine. These are all elements, but different than say something like aluminum. Aluminum comes just like this, Al, by itself not connected to anything else. If you took iron off the periodic table, it's just Fe by itself. Copper, it's just by itself. These are all the elemental forms of these seven elements, but they are also molecules. And molecules are basically the combination of two or more atoms. Atoms are basically the basic unit of any element that you could have. So an atom is made up, as we'll talk about, protons, electrons, and neutrons. It is the basic representation of an element. So for example, when we look at hydrogen, the way it comes when hydrogen is by itself in its elemental form is basically two hydrogens that are bound together. When oxygen comes together in its basic elemental form, it comes as two oxygens that are bound together. Same thing with nitrogen and its elemental form comes with two nitrogens atoms that are bound together. These are all two atoms in each of these. So these are what are referred to as being diatomic molecules. Diatomic, die for two, atomic for atoms. So two atoms and they are molecules. So this brings up some confusion that sometimes people have in terms of some of this terminology. And an element can also be made up of a molecule. So H2 is an element. H2 is also a molecule because it meets the definition of a molecule. It is two atoms that are together. Sodium chloride is not an element. It is a compound. And it could also be classified as a molecule as well, because it meets the basic definition of two atoms that have come together. Um, so compound and molecules is what kind of confuses people sometimes. 
So molecules is just a basic definition that means two or more atoms come together. Those two or more atoms that come together can be the same element or different elements. A compound though is two or more atoms of different elements coming together. And that is the difference between a compound and a molecule. In a compound, it has to be different elements coming together like we have here with sodium chloride. We have a sodium, which is one element, and a chlorine, which is another. H2, which are two hydrogen atoms that are coming together, is not a compound because it is not two different elements. It is still the same element that's coming together. So a molecule can be same elements and different elements. A compound has to be different elements to come together. And again, that's the, the slight difference there that is the difference between a compound and a molecule. And that is, again, something that very much confuses people sometimes. Uh, you know, they sound like they could be very similar to get as the same, uh, but that is the major difference. So compound has to be two or more elements, and a molecule doesn't. It could be the same elements or different elements, but you just need two or more atoms together. Okay. And again, uh, these are the these seven here you should know as they are diatomic molecules that come together. So uh, the question is, is water considered a, uh, a compound or element? So water is H2O. So water is considered a compound. It cannot be an element because an element is just one atom of a particular type. It could also be a molecule because it also meets the basic definition of two or more atoms that are bound together uh, to make something like water. Uh, so water could be a compound, a molecule cannot be an element. So this is not an element. Now individually water is, if you broke water into its elements, it is made up of H2 and O2. This is an element and can also be a molecule because it's a diatomic molecule. This is an element and also a molecule as well. Now, when we talk about molecules or we talk about sort of compounds, we can break them into elements but as soon as you get to elements, you can't go any further. So that's what this little sort of decision tree is here. Uh, matter can be separated by physical means, then you have a mixture going on, like our homogeneous or heterogeneous we talked about. If you can't separate them by physical means, then you have a pure substance. And if you can break it down into simpler guys, then you have a compound. If you can't break it down into simpler guys, then you have an element. Um, so for example, when we talked about the water going to H2 plus O2, this is a compound that could be broken down into its elements, these two guys. But once we get here to our H2 and our O2, because these are elements, we're not going to be able to go any further. So again, the H won't break apart into like two separate H's or anything like that. It will stay together. And that is its basic elemental form uh, for both of those guys. So uh, talking a little bit about elements, there's 117 elements over uh, the century has been found. Uh, 88 of them occur naturally, 29 are sort of synthesized. If you look on the periodic table, uh, there's usually sort of a big group of elements and then there's kind of like two little rows on the bottom on most periodic tables. And uh, most of those sort of man-made elements and stuff like that are found kind of on those two rows on the bottom of the periodic table, the very kind of bottom row of the main spot is where we find them as well. Now when we talk about elements, they are represented by symbols. And when we look at the periodic table, and we'll see it a little bit later, I think, uh, in another chapter, maybe next chapter, I think. Um, <clears throat> if you have one, you can take a look at it now. But uh, when we look at elements on the periodic table, they're basically represented uh, by one of two ways in terms of their symbols. A symbol can either be a one letter or two-letter symbol. 
If it is one letter, then it is capitalized. If it is two letters, then the first letter is always capitalized. The second one is not. And names of elements and symbols of elements come from a wide variety of sources. Uh, they can be uh, uh, from where they were discovered, uh, by who they were discovered, named after famous scientists and stuff like that. You do need to sort of get some name and symbol recognition. It's going to help you a lot, especially when we get to chapter, I want to say three or four, when we start talking about naming. So there's a lot of rules in terms of naming. I would highly recommend if you're not familiar with symbols and element names that go with them, that you start working on that now, uh, because it's just going to make it easier for you when we get to those chapters where we talk about naming. Because like I said, there's a lot of rules that go with the naming part of it. So if you're still trying to figure out, you know, what element is which symbol, is gonna make it just twice as hard for you. So some symbols, for example, like NA, capital N, lowercase a, that's something like sodium. We have uh, CU, which is copper. Uh, we have something like SN, which is tin. Again, capital lowercase. Uh, some other ones, uh, PB is lead. Uh, we have ZN, which is zinc. We have C, which is carbon. Uh, we have N, which is nitrogen. These guys, again, single letters capitalized. Uh, so you do need to start to get uh, some familiarity with it. So for example, there is a difference, and if you write everything sort of in capital letters, which sometimes people do, um, you really shouldn't do that when you're doing symbols. So for example, if you take CO, or you write CO, these are actually two different things and they represent two different things. Capital C lowercase o is cobalt, which is a symbol and an element. Capital C capital O is carbon monoxide, which is something very different than cobalt. So again, if you do capitalize everything, you should definitely not do that. Uh, with symbols because you may actually be saying something you don't mean to do. Uh, you're not expected to memorize the uh, periodic table uh, in, in a sense. So let me just put it this way. Like uh, a periodic table will be provided for you. A periodic table will contain just the symbols but not the names. So you do need to know, like I said before, uh, the names and the symbols that go with it. And uh, since I don't really have a periodic table, like we usually just point to the wall. But if you look at the periodic table, for example, they kind of look like this, right? For the most part, the two rows on the bottom, you, you probably don't have to worry too much about anybody down there. The only one maybe is you, which is uranium, is the only one kind of in those two rows on the bottom. In terms of elements that we usually sort of, uh, you know, see a lot, you know, kind of these first little areas on the left-hand side of the periodic table, if you look at the top, it'll say like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, kind of in this area and, you know, kind of in the first couple of rows and a little bit here where this is like things like uh, tin, lead and that sort of area. You know, those are some of those things. Other symbols and stuff that we come across a lot, you know, AU is gold, AG is silver. So, I, I think on the on the syllabus on the homework part it says you should memorize I think elements uh, symbols for one through forty and you know if you sort of know those I'll probably take care of a lot of symbols that you'll come across and again um, probably definitely where it's really all going to come together in terms of symbols and names is in that chapter when we talk about nomenclature and naming things it's definitely by that point you know you really should have a pretty good handle on on some of those common names. And when we see sort of a, a periodic table, I'll really point out to all those things. But that's normally when you look at the periodic table, left-hand side, right-hand side, upper right-hand side, and sort of dead center top part are where a lot of those symbols and, and names that you sort of need to uh, figure out the, uh, the symbols and the names that go with them. And here is from your book uh, as well, the symbols that go with it. And again, you know, you don't need to memorize every single symbol that's on the periodic table. And as we go through these different sort of chapters at the beginning 
and we definitely get into naming and stuff like that, you'll get probably a pretty good handle as to, you know, which ones you probably definitely should know, uh, the ones that really do come up a lot. And, you know, you'll be able to sort of recognize those things. All right. Any questions on that? <clears throat> Okay, so again, if you do have questions, feel free to ask him. If we happen to move past it, I will definitely come back and answer your questions. Uh, so again, we sort of jumped on this a little bit earlier, but just to reiterate here, atoms, again, are really the, the smallest sort of representation of elements that can exist. Uh, they, they do basically are composed of, as we'll talk about, I think, in Chapter 3, uh, even smaller particles like protons, electrons, and neutrons. And... They are the basic representation, basically, of elements. Molecules, as we talked about, again, different than compounds in a sense. The basic definition, you could kind of think of molecules as just that basic definition of we just need two or more atoms together. And again, what we were just talking about can be the same element, can be different elements. They will all still be molecules. But remember, again, compounds has to be different elements. Now, when we talk about molecules, we talked also a little bit about this as a second ago. When we have two atoms together, those are what are referred to as being diatomic molecules. Uh, if you have three atoms together, they are sometimes referred to as being triatomic, tri meaning three. Tetra is four atoms, penta is five, and you could continue on, hexa is six, hepta is seven, Octa is eight, Nona is nine, and Deca is like 10. So you kind of continue on with those. We could also describe molecules as being either homoatomic or heteroatomic, and that's very similar to heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures. Just like in a homogeneous mixture, everything looks the same throughout, in a homoatomic molecule, you basically have all of the same elements. So like H2 is an example of that. H2 is two hydrogens, right? So it is homoatomic, O2 as well, two oxygens, homoatomic. Heteroatomic molecules contain two or more kinds of atoms. So CO, which is carbon and oxygen involved. That would be heteroatomic, CO2, also carbon and oxygen involved. This would be a diatomic molecule. This guy has one carbon and two oxygens. That is three atoms. And this would be a triatomic molecule as well. So here's some examples here. Again, uh, Cl2, that is homoatomic and also diatomic. They're both chlorines. These are all phosphorus atoms, uh, which means it's homoatomic. And this would be tetraatomic as per four. That's a lot to count there, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight for the sulfur. But they're all sulfur, so these will all be homoatomic. And it'll be octa, uh, octaatomic here. Here we have A and B, this would be heteroatomic as they are two different elements. Same thing here, all these guys would be heteroatomic on the bottom. Uh, this would be diatomic, triatomic here, uh, tetraatomic and also tetraatomic over here as it has four uh, involved. So when we write formulas for molecules, uh, we do use a chemical formula, and basically chemical formulas are made up of the chemical symbols, and we use a number written to the bottom right of the symbol to indicate how many there are of each of those elements. Now, those are subscripts that go on the bottom, and they do go with the right. So, for example, here with our H2O, the two goes to the guy to the right, so that means that we have two hydrogens involved there. When we do not see a number here, that's actually a comma. When we don't see a number here, it means one. So H2O has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Here, this guy would have nine carbon atoms. He would have eight hydrogen atoms. 
and this guy here would have four oxygen atoms in this case. When we look at this guy here, which is aluminum sulfate, this has two goes to here, two aluminum atoms. But in this particular case, we have some parentheses and actually a three on the outside. And what that means is when we look at a formula like this, we actually do need to distribute that three in to both of these guys. So in the sulfur here, there's only one, but there's three of them, which means that there would be three sulfurs here. And there's four oxygens on the inside and three of them, which means that there would be 12 oxygens involved in that. And that's what the parentheses mean there. So Al2SO43, what it means is basically you have two aluminum ions, which are plus three each. And what you have are basically three of these units here, which we'll talk about in a later chapter. This is what is known as sulfate. And you basically have three of these sulfate guys together. And if you count it up here, one sulfur, two sulfurs, and three sulfurs, which is how we get to the three sulfurs. And if you count the oxygens, forget about the charge for now. I'll just get rid of the charge for now. If you count just the oxygens, we have four here and four here is eight and four more is 12. And again, that's where the 12 basically comes from in here. So typically in most things in chemistry, we don't include the one if it's just one of something. Anything else, we do use a two. And when you write a chemical form, it should always be a subscript, the guy on the bottom, no big numbers or anything like that uh, in between. So for example, like we did before, carbon monoxide, capital C, capital O, nothing written next to these guys would indicate that there is one of each of them. So one carbon and also one oxygen in this case as well. And same thing when we did the CO2, nothing written next to the carbon indicates one carbon atom, two would go with the oxygen, two oxygen atoms are present in that case. Any questions on chemical formulas? Okay. So then let's talk about measurements and chemistry. And <clears throat> when we talk about measurements, uh, you know, it's important when we take a measurement, measurements are what are referred to as being quantitative, uh, which means that they really should consist of two things. When you take a measurement, it should always have a number and almost just as important or even more important, it should have units associated with it. And that's because units are really important. So for example, if I say I have a hundred, nobody knows what I'm really talking about. I could have a hundred dollars, which is very different than if I had a hundred apples or, you know, if I had a hundred pennies, that's very different as well. So a number by itself is really not a measurement a number should always be have a unit that goes along with it. And when you take measurements or record measurements in lab, you definitely should always include the units, never just a number. Because a unit really does give us sort of a understanding of what that number means. Again, $100 is very different than it's 100 outside, right? 100 degrees Celsius or something like that, or 100 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Uh, very different sort of meaning to that number. So when we take a measurement, it determines the dimensions, the capacity, the quantity of something. These are common things that we you know, measure, mass, volume, length, time, temperature, pressure, concentration. Now, there's really two really main system of units. One is the English system, which is you know what we use. And pretty much everybody else in the world uh, you know, uses the metric system for the most part. And you can imagine that uh, over time, that probably not such a great thing as the world got smaller. If we're kind of using the English system, like miles and so forth, and everybody else is using things like kilometers, while you look in your car, right, on your speedometer, you got all your miles per hour, and then underneath it, you have your kilometers, right, per hour and all that kind of stuff. And again, those are the two different sort of units that are used. So believe it or not, in like 1960, they had sort of like a conference on units. Probably was a lot of fun, probably not. But they came up with really what you'll sometimes hear in chemistry, not so much I think in your textbook, but in your 
lab manual book uh, is what's referred to as the SI unit of uh, measurement. And the SI units are what are referred to as the International System of Units, which is kind of what SI stands for, the International System of Units. And it's really based off of the metric system. So it really is sort of based off of the metric system. And in chemistry and a lot of sciences, we oftentimes will use the SI units um, when we do things. And so if you hear somebody say the SI units, you know, it's really almost the metric system and it's sort of based off of the metric system, but it's sort of a agreed upon sort of unit in, in science and definitely in chemistry. Some of our base units, when we talk about things uh, in the metric system, the meter is the base unit for length. Uh, so when we talk about a meter, you know, we're talking sort of like a distance or the length of something. A gram is the base unit for mass. Uh, our kilogram is also a very common unit that's used, as you may be aware of, in the metric system, as we'll see shortly. There's a lot of prefixes that are used to sort of change the meaning, like kilo, millo, millo, uh, milli, um, mega, you know, those type of things. And it's a good difference to talk about that there actually is a difference between mass and weight. And it, the difference is when we talk about the weight of something, it involves basically the force or the pull of gravity on it. So it's affected by the force of gravity weight. Mass is sort of independent of the force of gravity. So in chemistry and most sciences, when you go do that process known as weighing of something, you really shouldn't refer to it as weight. You should refer to it as mass. And again, the mass of an object here and say on the moon would be the same. The weight of an object here and the weight of something on the moon uh, would be different because the force of gravity is different on the moon than it is here. Um, so you should get into the habit of not calling things the weight of something. It should be referred to really as the mass of something, uh, definitely in chemistry. The liter is a common unit for volume. Uh, a couple other common units that we oftentimes will see is milliliter and CMs cubed, that is centimeters cubed. That's the same as a cc, right? A cubic centimeter. And, you know, you oftentimes hear about that or see those on medical shows, or if you work in the medical field, you have somebody five cc's, four cc's of something, and that's basically a milliliter. They're all the same. They're all like a one-to-one -one relationship here. And uh, the way we get something like that, a cubic centimeter is actually a volume. And if you take the length of something times the width times the height, and you measure each of these in centimeters, each of these individual measurements, these individually are length measurements. The length, obviously, the width of something in centimeters, the height of something in centimeters are all length measurements. But when we multiply length measurements together and cube it, we get cubic centimeters, which is a volume. So typically in a cube, if you take the length cubed, that will equal a volume. So if you're talking about something that has units of centimeters by itself, just straight old centimeters, that is a unit of length. If you take something that's cubic centimeters, that's a volume. Same thing if you have just a meter by itself, that would be a length measurement. If you have meters cubed, that would be a volume measurement. So that's a very common one. Also another common conversion there is one liter is a thousand milliliters. You use that a lot here in chemistry. And here are those prefixes that we commonly use to go from sort of one number to the next in the metric system. Also helps us avoid all those zeros that may get lost along the way. And I do find that most people do not know how to actually use this table that you can find in your book correctly. So for example, let's take a look at this. So typically we take a look at, you know, our kind of prefixes here and our times 10 part of what they mean. So for example, centi, if we look on that little table, centi means 10 to the minus two. And when we see 10 to the minus two on the right-hand side of this table, 10 to the two, 10 to the three, whatever it may be, what that represents is in one of the base units, I'm sorry, 
in one of the prefix units. That's how much there is in the base unit. So for example, if we're looking at centimeters and meters, our base unit is meters. Our prefix unit is centimeters. What that would mean is in one centimeter, there is 10 to the minus two meters. And I can't tell you how often people get this backwards. They go 10 to the minus two centimeters in a meter. So when you pull that number off of this table, that is how much there is in the base unit to one of the prefix unit. So for example, let's take a look at kilo. Kilo is 10 to the three. So if we were looking at kilograms and grams, what that would mean is in one of the prefix units, which is kilograms, there would be 10 to the three grams. And again, very common mistake that people make when they do that. They always have that conversion sort of backwards. It doesn't matter what the base unit is, it will still work the same way. So if I want to know how many kiloliters there are in a liter, there would be one kiloliter in 10 to the three liters. If I want to know how many kilometers there are in a meter, again, kilometers being our prefix unit, meters being our base unit, there would be one kilometer is 10 to the three meters. So very important when you use these prefixes that you sort of do it correctly. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. Very, very super common error that people make is, you know, kind of doing it backwards. By the way, if we do something like our one centimeter is 10 to the minus two meters, and we divide both sides by 10 to the minus two, we will get 100 centimeters is a meter, which is a perfectly fine conversion as well. And we get that again by taking 10 to the minus two divided by 10 to the minus two equals one divided by 10 to the minus two, which will give you your 100. And obviously that would give you your one. So sometimes you'll see people use, you know, 100 centimeters is a meter or one centimeter is 10 to the minus two uh, meters. And again, uh, they're both perfectly fine, but very commonly, like I said, people oftentimes will do that. By the way, that is in scientific notation, one times 10 to the minus two is essentially what that means. One times 10 to the three is what that means as well. We'll talk about scientific notation in just a second in terms of how to properly sort of put those things in the calculator. Any questions on that there? So, you know, centi we use a lot, milli we use a lot, kilo we use a lot. Uh, you know, not too much nano in this class or mega. So really those kind of few there, uh, kilo, centi, milli, you know, we do come across a lot, deci occasionally, but you know, those are sort of the big ones that we would definitely do come across a lot. So as I mentioned before, uh, that's a volume uh, when we take something like length times width times height. And again, each of those individually here, again, are a length measurement but when we multiply them all together, it then becomes a, a volume measurement. Uh, and same thing here, 1,000 milliliters, 1,000 cubic centimeters, and so forth. Again, taking our length times our width times our height. This is something that we see a lot, especially when we talk about density. That's a very common way uh, that we do calculate the volume when dealing with density. And that's a very common unit of density is part of it is cubic centimeters. So we do see that a lot um, when, we, especially when we see density as well. So let's talk about sort of numbers and what comes about those numbers. And we come across really two types of numbers. One are what are referred to as exact numbers. And exact numbers have really no uncertainty with it. And really what these both kind of deal with is, is what is known as significant figures. And if you have an exact number, it's really one of two things. It can either be a definition, like one inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters. There's 12 inches in a foot. One pound is 453.6 grams. These are all basically equalities. They are two things that represent the same amount of something, but are on different units. 
kind of like, you know, if you have a hundred pennies, that's the same as one dollar. They're just different units represent the same amount. The other thing is you could get an exact number by counting. So for example, if you had four apples that were on your desk, you wouldn't do any type of weird scientific experiment to figure out how many apples you have sitting on your desk. You would simply just count how many apples that you have on your desk. And when you count them, that is also as known as an exact number. Now in terms of significant figures, which is really what, you know, it, it kind of deals with, the idea there is it could have as many significant figures as you want. And really where that's gonna come into play is if we consider something an exact number, the nice thing is we don't really have to worry about it in terms of significant figures when we do calculations. And that's different than inexact numbers. Inexact numbers are basically what occurs in measurements. And when we take a measurement, there's always some degree of uncertainty that occurs when we actually take a measurement. So no matter who takes the measurement, no matter what sort of device that you take the measurement on, there's always gonna be some degree of uncertainty associated with that measurement. And you need to sort of figure out you know, what it is. The degree of uncertainty will be based on the actual equipment that you use as to how far you can actually take the reading. So let's talk about actual measurements and uncertainty in it. So for example, if we take, go down here. If we take, <clears throat> take like a ruler here and we'll call this one. We'll call this two, we'll call this centimeters. And let's say we drew like an arrow. And let's kind of stop it ish, stop it here. Now, when we would look at this and we want to take a measurement, when we look at the actual ruler, there are certain numbers that no matter who actually looks at it, everybody should agree upon that, hey, it's at least this amount. And there's some numbers that we can't necessarily agree upon. But the first thing that you always want to do when you look or going to take a measurement is you want to look at the scale. And if we start counting right here, we don't usually count the first big number. We go to the guy next to it. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 markings. So we have 10 little markings that's basically between one centimeter, right? Between one and two is one centimeter. That means that each individual little marking represents 0 0.1 centimeters. So the first marking here would be kind of super blow it up. If this is one, the next marking would be 1.1. Next marking would be 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, so on and so forth. So where my arrow is would represent 1.1. The next one to it would be 1.2. This would be 1.3 and this would be 1.4. Now, when we look at this, no matter who looks at it, they should agree that this blue line on top is at least 1.4 centimeters. But the problem is, in my really bad drawing here, I think I did all right. That drawing is not exactly at 1.4, nor is it exactly at 1.5 because, you know, I spread the little line there. So this is where the uncertainty in this measurement would come into. I may look at it and go, I think it's like halfway between those two parts. It's halfway between 1.4, which is here, and 1.5, which is here. And I would record 1.45, centimeters. Somebody else may look at it and go, I think you're crazy. I think it's definitely way closer to the 1.5 and I would record 1.48 centimeters, for example. And when we make this recording, we want to record all the certain numbers, which would be the 1.4 and our first uncertain number. When we record all of the certain numbers in a measurement and that first uncertain number in a measurement, 
That is what is really known as significant figures. Which you can now tell me if you look at this measurement, if it was recorded at 1.45, this guy would have three significant figures in this particular one. So with this, with the uncertainty lying in this five in my example over here, and what that really means is this measurement could be 1.45, or it could be maybe 1.46, could be like 1.44. The uncertainty is over here in this last digit. And again, somebody else may even think it's a little bit higher than that and go to eight as well. But there's that's where sort of the uncertainty lies in that particular measurement. And it does vary depending on, you know, the equipment that you're using. So for example, if we looked at You know, if we looked at a graduated cylinder, we'll go this way. And let's say we had a uh, 10 and and this is 20. And when we fill up a graduated cylinder, I'll just make my graduated cylinder to the left. Whenever we take a reading of a liquid, we typically will see this curvature of the liquid. I'll make an exaggerated here. And this is what is known as the meniscus. And when we read a liquid in a glass container, we always want to read from the bottom of the meniscus. So you always want to read from the bottom of the meniscus when you take a volume reading. Now when we look at this scale here, this is 10 and this is 20. Starting to count right here, that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten markings. This is ten markings now between ten and twenty, which is actually ten milliliters. That means in this particular case, each of the smallest markings is one milliliter. That means that this guy would be 11, this guy would be 12, this guy would be 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 there at the top. So now when we look at it, again, we'll do my best drawing as I can here. We'll go somewhere in this area. Everybody here should agree it is at least 14. And again, it's not exactly at 14, not exactly at 15 in this particular case. So this is where our estimate has to come into place. And again, I may say, I think it's dead on half, 14.5 milliliters. Somebody else may say, hey, it's 14.3 milliliters, something like that. In this case, the 14 would be our certain numbers. And the five here would be our first uncertain number. And again, this would be all the significant figures and this guy would have three significant figures in this particular case. Now, what you can hopefully see is the smallest marking was one milliliter and we were able to go, typically speaking, one more place to the right of the smallest marking. Smallest marking on our graduated cylinder was the ones place. We were able to take the reading to the tenths place. Same thing here. Smallest marking on our ruler was 0.1. We were able to take the reading to one more place to the right. So typically speaking, you could typically take the reading one more place to the right of the smallest marking, but not in all cases. So for example, if we took here, we took our same sort of scale, 10, and 20. And again, if we just kind of put it right about there, this is 10 and this is 20 milliliters. There is now one, two, three, four, five markings between 10 milliliters. That means in this particular case, each of the smallest markings is two milliliters. This would be 12, this would be 14, 16, 18. So if we took our reading, we would fall somewhere in here. We're now between 16 and 18. 
and the best you could do on this particular scale is between 16 and 18 is 17 milliliters. Yeah. Which would mean hopefully you would know this has two significant figures in this case. The one being our certain number, the seven being our uncertain number in this case. And that means that this could be as big as 18 milliliters, which is about you know where it could be, or it could be as low as 16 milliliters going the other way. So in most cases, you could go to one more place to the right of the smallest marking, not 100% of the time. Um, <clears throat> and you do want to always make sure that you read the scale. No, so whenever you take any type of uh, any type of measurement, any type of reading, you should always record all of the certain numbers plus the first uncertain number. And that is basically what makes up significant figures. So always all of the certain numbers, and those are all the numbers that no matter what, everybody will agree upon and then you should record that first uncertain number, and that is the significant figure. So you wanna record all those numbers there uh, in each case. That also means, for example, here, uh, you know, in this case, if we look at the top scale here for the fish, this goes 30, 40, uh, 50, 60, it goes by 10, which means there really is no smallest marking. So the smallest marking is 10, and you basically can at best go to a whole number here. So here we got 53. This is our uncertain digit. This is our certain digit. They both were recorded. The uncertainty lies here in, in this three. It could be 53, maybe 54, maybe 52. Now, if we use a better ruler, like the bottom ruler, we got 50 and 60 and each of the little markings, there's 10 of them between them. Each one represents one. That would be 51 here, 52 here, 53 here. And again, because each of the markings is one milliliter or one uh, centimeter in this case, we could go one more place to the right and we could record 53.5. The uncertain number here being the five and these two guys being our certain number. This tells us it's 53.5, maybe it's 53.6. Maybe it's 53.4, which is a much better measurement than here because up here, this could be as big as 54, as little as 52. So a lot more error can occur in that top measurement. This also means that, for example, if we went back to this scale here, and let's just say that our guy you felt was dead on the 14. When you record it, you should record 14.0 milliliters because this number here has three significant figures. You're able to record to that decimal point based on the scale that's here. And that means that the uncertainty lies here. Very often what people will record is, hey, I'm just gonna record 14 milliliters because it's dead on the number. Not a big deal, but it is a big deal because when you record the number as 14, this has only two significant figures, which means the uncertainty in this number lies right here with the four, which means this could be as big as 15 or as small as 13, which if you look here at our measurement is really nowhere near 13 and it's really nowhere near 15 in terms of that. So that is a big amount of error as opposed to this measurement, which means it could be 14.1, which would be like right here or it may be 13.9, which would be like right there. And because you have the ability to do that, you should record it like we have over here on the right. When you lop off that significant figure, you're also really affecting how good of a measurement it is. You're making it a worse measurement in that particular case. Any questions on that? Okay, we will stop here today for lecture. A reminder that uh, if you have discussion today with me, come back through the discussion one. Everybody else that was with me on Monday for discussion should be off to lab today. And again, if you weren't here for lab on Monday and you're here today, you should go to the lab meeting hopefully as well. Uh, make sure that you do type here in the role for the chat 
And if there's no other questions, have a good weekend if you're leaving. For discussion, I'll see everybody in about five minutes or so through the discussion link. Have a good one if you're leaving. And again, we do have discussion, so come back in about five minutes or so.